My name's Duncan Cargill, I'm a garden designer, and I, though I don't have a garden of my own to show you around and talk about, I wanted to share with you a garden I greatly admire uh, that was created by Cecil Beaton at Reddish House in Wiltshire. He lived there from 1949 until his death in 1980, and I've been collecting photographs of it and um, pieces of film for years. So I've just put them together with a bit of narrative and um, I hope you enjoy it. I've always enjoyed the colours of the late 1950s and early 1960s in fashion and in gardens. Coy, dusty pinks and peaches next to more dramatic, bold reds and oranges. The art Beaton brought to his garden was perfectly in step with his work for magazines, stage and screen. His eye for colour, texture, light and scale transformed Redditch inside and out and this is a glimpse at what he did to the garden over 30 years. In 1962, Reddish House was featured in House and Garden magazine. It showed the grand and exotic rooms he had created, full of their gilded furniture and unrestrained Rococo style. It concluded with a final paragraph that read, Little space remains to mention the garden, or rather gardens, which Mr Beaton has made at Reddish and which are prolific in ideas as the house itself. These must be left for another article. But that article was never written. The evidence we have of the 30 years of planning and development of his garden can only be gleaned from the photographs and some film shot by him and others. However, none of these address the garden itself, but they're of the models he shot, the people he knew and entertained, the professional and personal life at the house. Beaton worked all over the world and his commercial headquarters was in London, but his escape was to the county of Wiltshire, first to Ashcombe House near Shaftesbury and then to nearby Reddish House, just across the Cranbourne Chase, where he resided from 1947. Ashcombe, his previous country retreat, was a remote 17th century house and became his playground, a theatre set of moving parts, rooms, parties and people enjoying the calm before the storm of World War II. Reddish House was, in contrast, a place where his tastes settled into a permanent and increasingly traditional groove. For the ten years or so before Beaton arrived, the house and its two and a half acres of land had been home and office to a doctor and dentist. The garden had changed little since its rather practical manifestation at the turn of the 19th century a kitchen garden with a glass house, mown grass and no deliberate flower borders. When Beaton arrived, he left the arrival experience as it would have been for many years before him. The charmingly elegant facade was enough with its mix of 17th and early 18th century architectural detailing. A flight of cut stone steps rose up to a welcoming central door. Blushing pink brick provided a warm background for the weathered columns and dressed coins all in the creamy pink-grey local Portland limestone. By simply retaining the in-out drive and adding no fancy borders, Beaton echoed the appearance of grand estates whose parks appeared to run right up to the house. One of the first areas of the garden Beaton addressed was the sun-soaked south-facing terrace at the back of the house. He increased its width, cutting further into the sharply rising bank and laying it with reclaimed York stone. Here he established beds on either side, one against the house and the other against the bank, and he added a theatrical painted wooden balustrade to its edge. He also created a smaller balcony style terrace higher up the bank for the door of the second floor drawing room. On the walls of this new terrace he pulled down ivy and other unwanted climbers, and here he placed big single and double headed blousy roses like climbing dawn and vigorous climbing hybrid teas. These were balanced by Clematis, including Nellie Moser. He carefully constructed this scene, referencing the late 18th century romantic style of paintings by artists like Fragonard and Watteau. This was an echo of his approach to the garden at Ashcombe, this theatre set of individual tableaus happening to be perfect for photographing portraits, sprinkled with hot red geranium, pink dianthus, and shoots of ever-faithful snapdragon. An existing gravel path had led from the terrace downwards to some steps into the kitchen garden. He moved the path south, higher up the lawn, 
to a part of the garden on the same level as the terrace. The new path, shown here by setting the model's waist, led to a new opening in the lawn hedging, where he would eventually plant a walk of vertical yew. This new axis created a more dynamic view from the terrace, making the walk not a practical one to a kitchen garden, but to a brand new destination. It also took the existing path away from the staff cottages. It would transform the west side of the garden, leading to the resurrection of an orchard and the creation of a new rose garden. He also added a winter garden conservatory at the same level, both extensions making way for a new upper terrace. To access this from the existing terrace, new steps were laid through the balustrade and up the bank to a new north-facing bench. This upper terrace stretched west onto the lawn. Beaton decided that further digging was needed to allow a kinder view of the steep bank from inside the drawing room and the winter garden. A typically elegant solution to soften this dramatic excavation was found with a long, slim groove and neat serif points to punctuate the bank. Along the top of this upper terrace, he planted hundreds of daffodils, creating another layer of garden closer to the trees. Beaton then turned his artist's eye to the composition of pots along both terraces. These same basket-style pots were moved about the garden constantly for the 30 years Beaton was at Reddish, filled with everything from carnations, snapdragons, nicotina and geraniums. They greeted visitors at the front door, flanked the terrace steps and marked the beginning and end of the new walk. The terrace and the roses on its walls continue to change. By the 1960s, the planting had become much more relaxed and the palette restrained to whites and blues with spots of citrus and clarets. Perennials were used to break up the stone and rosemary bloomed by the door. Next to the roses, a new clematis in dark purple counterbalanced the white one and a peach climbing rose reached its way across the drawing room wall. Billowing lavender edged the steps with alchemilla and primroses for bascom and self-seeding white valerian scattered itself between the cracks. Shrub roses were encouraged to run along the balustrade and various erigeron in whites and pinks, rose campion and lime euphorbia made themselves more variously at home. At the back of the terrace, against the outside wall of his small flower room, giant plume poppy cordata grew with its beautiful foliage flopping down behind the bench. Along the wall adjacent to the terrace, Beaton planted phlox and digitalis, and as the wall turned towards the thatch cottage, he created a cliff of climbing white roses, lupins and carnations. The new cottage garden replaced what had been a large greenhouse, and Beaton realigned the edge of that bed to sit more parallel with the new gravel path. He went about creating a deep border with a classic English cottage garden mix of perennial and self-seeding annuals. He placed numerous shrub roses like the Pink Queen of Denmark alongside the white-scented Madame Hardy. Beaton's photographs and sketchbooks from that period show the fruits of his labour. The foxgloves, forget-me-nots, anemones, peony, sweet william and moss roses abound. The garden furniture remained the same classic French-style garden chairs and a snug wooden bench. They did, however, frequently change colour, from white to green and back again. Beaton also enjoyed the shade of a raspberry-striped sun umbrella for many years. Above the house, the grass bank rose up towards a line of trees. The view from this point was the best in the garden, with the sweeping lines of Cranbourne Chase rolling across the horizon. Beaton played with this boundary, from running the lawn alongside an unmown meadow to a fenced paddock. Eventually, he settled with positioning a bench there beneath an arch of roses whose arms of garlands reached out in a semicircle to either side. There were also gardens that he created that were not visible from the main house. These included a rose garden and an adjacent orchard. The rose garden began life as a formal, quartered circle of beds with paths that met beneath an ornate white-painted wire pagoda. Over time, the garden became a flowering meadow of poppies and daisies, punctuated by the shrub and standard rose bushes. The orchard was already in place, but Beaton replaced and added further trees, filled it with different varieties of daffodils, both whites and yellows, 
and frequently used its little thatched shed for fashion shoots reaching back to the early 1950s. Alongside the orchard and rose garden was where he planted the yew walk, the destination at the end of his new long path. Across the road from the front of the house, Beaton purchased a couple of acres of what was wet meadow. He took a spur off the river Ebble and created a large pond with an island. He moved the meadow gate from the main road to a line with the front door of the house, planted yew hedging along the near boundary and planted trees and swathes of bulbs, including snowdrops and bluebells. Beaton made the garden at Reddish a place of delight and surprise, a series of different experiences of colour, texture and scent. My favourite part of his garden was perhaps its smallest. Out of sight sat a hidden terrace in between the drive and the gate to the back garden, hedged in by tall yew. Here he created a small courtyard, using the pink brick as a backdrop to the green foliage of ferns, hostas and hydrangea, offsetting it all with spots of lemon yellow from jasmine and Welsh poppy. It was a stage for Fame, who stood on a modest pedestal with a trumpet raised to her lips.